I'm going to start recording. There we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Hi, this is, uh, this is Florian from Berlin. Um, and I'm welcoming you to the fifth Sunday, Wednesday, actually, we're meeting here. The first three weeks were uh, investigating about experiences, open questions, and best, best practice examples about the work with the youth, uh, and especially also bringing somatic work to the youth on a point where it's not only about intervention, uh, where it is about the joy of our work and the benefits, the potential, and uh, everything that comes with being better connected to your body and how you can be connected to worlds than around you. And we have uh, Laura here. Uh, we started this group together a couple of weeks ago from the idea that we think that somatic inter training or education would have helped us, uh, or at least me, because she has some parts of it um, tremendously in, in navigating, orienting in the world with a third resource of our body. Uh, Alicia is one of our, uh, uh, I think, Treue, uh, you say in German, or most faithful regulars here in the group. And uh, to all of you who are watching the recording, also welcome. Uh, I just mentioned um, before we started in the introduction that I've been working on uh, intervention with children of all ages in my training with Martha Eddy uh, and a couple of other students, uh, especially in that group was Lama from Singapore and Natasha from Switzerland. And we've been speaking about in, a, in the therapy setting with a one-on-one -on -one child, uh, what are the things that could really support the setting? And today then we want to go more into creating ideas about a, 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 a dive-in course for young, young human beings to get to know somatic movement, uh, conscious movement, uh, and uh, I still want to mention these points because they were uh, basically the what crystallized out of like a five week intervention uh, or like investigation on like what's going to be important. And uh, just going to go ahead. Uh, in the setting of working with a child one on one, uh, it's a constant assessment, we realized. And the assessment also begins when the caregiver and the children are entering the room, not only when they are already in the room and ready to start the class or the session or whatever you want to call it, uh, there is a constant, constant assessment because especially the relation of the caregiver and the child will always be important because you are with the child maybe one hour a week, maybe three hours a week, but the caregiver is spending 99% with the kid. And this is why the relation in between them and also involving them into the work and seeing the process and supporting it when you are not around is really required and important. And in the beginning, we said that us as practitioners or therapists should always be on one level with the child. So wherever the child decides to start the work or the getting to know each other, if it's on the floor, if it's sitting, if it's laying down, get in the same position, build a rapport and uh, build a connection. And we... Um, we go over my floppy notes here. Uh, we said that a room in the best case is uh, having the possibility to play, move, climb, maybe a ball, but also to hide and especially to rest because you don't over want to overwhelm a young person with like maybe all the things that you intended to do. And which brings to the next point that such sessions should grow organically um, and they should be supportive for the child and not uh, supporting the plan that you made uh, to, to push them through. And there is constant observation as example, what are they gravitating to? What are they going away from? What is attracting them? How are they involving with touch? Are they shy? Are they looking for permission before they are using the ball to play with from their caregiver or from you? Or are they super self-esteem on just, just doing their thing? Um, what's really supportive also is, I think it's also for the group uh, of like more children is having a mirror in the room to see how the child is having a sense of self. If it is like focused on itself in the mirror, if it's focused on other children, if it's focused on, as I said before, the practitioner, the caregiver. And uh, exactly, the rest is very therapeutic. I don't need to go on to that, but uh, just like a couple of, couple of points, what I think for us the most important is to really be on one level with the people that you want to engage with and not be like in the very old school setting, like I'm here, I'm the expert, you follow me. And maybe Laura, Alicia, uh, both uh, experienced in the work can take it from here. You did, Laura? Yeah. yeah, 
I have something to add to that because um, I was just reading an article uh, that was talking about learning and how if we if we learn something, the most effective way of learning is instead of learning and then learning and then learning and then learning is like learning and then taking a total break and having a processing chance. And that total break is not a time where you're looking at your phone or you're doing something else. It's like really nothing. You give your brain and your body a chance to process. And I think that this is the thing that the kids that I encounter are missing and are ever having a chance to just stop and process. And I think what you, you pointed to, or you said about not having our own agenda and trying to hit all the things, okay, we need them to, we need to do this, this, and this, but sometimes like just doing one thing or having, you know, a deeper experience, <coughs> excuse me, having a deeper experience that can really land and then some processing time afterwards. And the processing time doesn't have to be, we're going to talk. <laughs> it could also be, let's just lay here or, you know, sit, play something that is nonverbal. So I think that's a really important thing. And I think that that is a pervasively important thing in all learning, in all sessions with people. And it's something that we've really lost. I mean, if you think about like a yoga class, there's Shavasana at the end, right? There's that chance to process and to take it in, to let the tissue, the body takes time and the body mind takes time. So I feel like that's such a, a nice thing. And also coming in at the level and seeing what's going on and being attentive to the moment from the second that it begins with any one person, you know, whether it's on the phone or anything else, like all of that is the assessment. I love that. That's great. Alicia, you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah. Um, so actually I really agree with the point that Florian you made about mirrors, the activity I actually brought to share involved that as well. I think there's such, even if you watch babies, how fascinated they are by viewing that perception. And I think even with learning or experiencing something for the first time, it's a great indicator for children who might not have a connection with their bodies, might not have a connection with their facial expressions. So it gives them some insight as to how they're being perceived in the outside world. Because I can't, I can think of how many times parents have said, my child always looks grumpy and usually older adolescents like 11, 12, 13, and they're not grumpy. They're just not aware of the facial expression they're putting out into the outside world. For them, everything's fine, but others are perceiving it in a particular way. And I also, there's a great book and I'll find it and post it in the group called Experience Nature. And it talks about what Laura, what you were talking about, this idea of even adults need that processing time between learning and the idea of giving them something that energizes them. So encouraging them that yes, this is a break, but if you want to choose to move, go for it and giving them that space and that freedom to use their body to process information. Um, my experience, I used to let the kids outside, like even if it wasn't recess time, if we just done something heavy or they learned a bunch of new information all at once, I would open the back door of the, I guess, studio space where we work and they would go outside in the backyard and, and just have some time and come back in after 10, 15 minutes. So yeah, I think the idea of unstructured play or unstructured outdoors time is really important depending what environment we choose to do this in. Definitely, and also uh, to, to in to really observe the way they are engaging with outside world through their bodies. If they have a natural trust that they can climb on a tree, you know, or if they are like, if there is in general, like a, a certain attention, nervousness about getting in touch. Yeah, please don't forget to share this book. So it sounds super interesting. Also to everybody watching, if you, uh, if you join this, Facebook group that we have, there is a Google Doc, which is documenting the process. And there is also some resources, recommendations for books and, uh, and a bit more information about like what, what we are currently aiming for. And uh, just to, to, to remind us what also the intention of today is a little bit is to, to really start go, get going into creating this, like a four week course or like a, like a 
six hour workshop or that, however you want to you want to work with this material is also going to be a, for you to adapt to your own needs to your own wants to your group you're working with and uh yeah it's just some ideas So do we want to go and like do um, do we want to like do our like each take a turn and, and offer a practice like what we had talked about doing before so that we're sort of embodying the work as it's going on or how do we what are we, what are we thinking? Any opinion about that? Oh. Wait, no, you heard me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking actually because I'm, I'm thinking I just like where, uh, I'm just uh, witnessing where my thoughts are going and I'm, I'm not, I was like still in a room with one person you know because I was also just like uh, in preparation for this re-evaluating this this weekend and this, uh, it's a therapy training therapist training that I'm doing with Martha so I'm trying to get a, a bit like a step back to like or like for sure integrating this into into the more educational part just to like saying like hey I have an open group like in the, in the best world, uh, the best case, I have like a, a group of, 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 of young people interested in, in joining into this and to see also how, how do we start? What, what would be the first thing we do? And well, how do we set up the room? What should be in the room? Is it, a is it, is it an open space? Is there, is there some, some toys around or some, some things to engage with? Yeah. Maybe Alicia, you can, or Laura, how do you do? Well, well, this, is just, this is just to say, I, I, I taught a play workshop with Liz Koch. We co-taught a workshop one weekend. And um, she, we, we had a huge dance studio and there were several physio balls there, but then there were also, she had also brought tons of little balls. And so we, and this was with adults, mm -hmm. so we, she threw the stuff all over the floor. So you came in and there's this like, it's a beautiful studio. There's light, wood floor, and there are these balls all over the place. And we had a plan on how we were gonna start, but it, it didn't start that way at all because of the way that people arrived and like what the arrival was and what the like meeting with people and the hello and what the, you know, but it ended up being very, I think that she actually was kind of on the floor on a ball as people were coming in. And so it wasn't like she had to get up and meet and introduce. Like it gave people permission to also like arrive and land however they wanted to, or they could talk to me and I'm kind of saying, well, I think we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. There's like given some structure as to what's gonna happen. But ultimately it was coming into the space with choice, right? With how are you gonna enter the space? And I think that this is something that like, this is one of the things of working with a group of kids that like, kids do really like structure. They do really need a consistency and regularity and being you know, a certain plan that they're gonna follow so they know what to expect on the one hand. And then the unstructured part and the freedom to arrive, like that's also important. So like, I think this comes to this balance, which I feel like we've talked about in a few different ways of like the freedom and the form. Like how do we provide enough structure that they're landing in something that makes some kind of sense? Uh, to the parents, the caregivers, and to the, the children, and yet provide this open space that really allows access to being present with what, what the desire is, and, and having some freedom around these things that you guys were both talking about when, like, are, do, they have, do they have to ask permission? Do they, how do they start to find a sense of agency of, of them learning to read the room? Like, what, what's appropriate when I come in, you know? And I feel like, that's a weird thing. That's our social construct of how we need to enter any kind of space and what's the right thing and what's the right greeting and what's the right landing. So I think like, and, and I have to say that with working with children, like I've had groups where I, like we come in and we're like, we come into stillness and softening and being in ourselves and, you know, focus. And I think that's a great landing point to then go out from. But sometimes it's not like that. And sometimes it's like we come in and we're crazy and then we wear ourselves out a little bit and then we can come into ourselves. So I, I think that, you know, I feel like the more that I try to come to an answer, the more questions I have and the more I, I think, oh yeah, it worked that way like that. Then it worked like that. And so, and I think one of my faults is that I am too much just geared to going with whatever's going on. And I think that sometimes structure is helpful. So Alicia, maybe you can talk to that a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, so in my experience, we have the big gymnasium. So similar to the studio. Um, one thing that I find is really helpful. And Susan Lamont, she had a really amazing session um, at the conference. And she talked about for folks who are neurodiverse, how they enter a room and the time they need to settle. And this is something I was doing instinctively, but didn't really see the benefit is I always kind of open things up for the first 15 minutes. And some kids, you know, their parents are ready to go. They arrive 10, 15 minutes before so their parents have work. They want to run errands, X, Y, Z. So giving them time to just run around, do whatever they want, if they want to sit, if they want to color. I always had options so they could talk to their friends. They could do an art activity. So they could play with the balls whatever was up within the room. So really having, you know, containers of things where they knew, okay, if I feel like this, I can go do this or I can talk to this person and having the staff that are in a, the room really available to talk, the kid had questions and really looking out for, you know, the kids who are just wandering around because they haven't seen anything like this before and giving them an opportunity to explore. One thing I've always found really helpful, even with teenage groups, is a lot of the gyms I've worked in, they have these little squares that have wheels on the bottom. And people, I have not yet met a child or a teenager who is not excited by those. And that's one way of getting them to transition to the floor. And I think, you know, once I started pulling those out, so I'd pull those out like the last five or 10 minutes before we're about to start. All the kids would grab one, they would start transitioning. They could stay on them if they liked. They could move to a floor or a chair. And I found that helpful to give them some structure. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. One, how big are the blocks with, with wheels on them? Oh, um, oh, maybe I can share my screen. Do you know what I could? Oh, let I me make you a the, uh, the square seat. They make adult size ones, but a lot of them are. <sighs> I see what you're a... searching. Yeah, I can. It... <sighs> I, was, I was just thinking about like this, like getting the, the, the way to the floor, which might mm -hmm. be literally uh, like, like very, when you just tell them now get on the floor, you know, it's, it doesn't sound very inviting. And that's why I love your approach of making it in a playful manner. Um, giving a little anecdote here. You know Moshe Feldenkrais, what he used to do after well, okay, how he told people we all get on the floor. It doesn't matter if you're a president or a nurse or like whoever is in this room, we all get on the floor together. And this is how we start. Um, yeah, it just reminded me that, but like for, 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 for young people, you might use a different approach to this because they might connect it to something very else. You know, they don't have this construct of hierarchy and yeah. And with the with the group of teenagers I work with, I, I start with a massive grounding, yeah. you know, like a very deep grounding, like a, like lot, just basically a third of the course. It's just the grounding and connecting to the body before you even go on. But uh, especially thinking about uh, working with with a younger group, mm -hmm. it, it might be also overwhelming for them, you know, like way too calming them down or too too contained as an as an entrance point. I think um, I'm just going to show you what I mean because it might it might not resonate to people in other cultures when I say blue square or oh, yeah. Yeah. they're like that um, or like that. There's smaller ones. They're usually blue, at least here. They call the floor a scooter. That is the word. Um, yeah, and I find that less jarring for younger kids because at least here they're used to and they'll. It's another way to assess their perception too. Some kids want to do a race with their friend. Some will sit there in the corner spinning around. So well, that's one of the reasons why I love it. And I think it's you know, a great therapeutic tool if they want to keep moving at, throughout the session too. If we're doing something like grounding, that might be a little uncomfortable. I know kids who know we're going to go do grounding now. This makes me feel safe. This makes me feel comfortable. I'm going to keep using it. And sometimes they don't use it every time, but yeah. I, oh my God. 
Happy that looked super exciting to me. I saw that like, oh my God, I want one of those. So like, I could totally see like yeah. that, that it would be absolutely accessible to kids, little kids, big kids, whatever, adult kids. Yeah. Adult want, adult love them too. They want to buy them. They're like, can we buy these? I'm like, oh, they're not mine. They came with the building. Oh my God, I got to get one. Um, and then the other question, who was the session in the in the embodiment conference that you liked that talked about it? Um, Suzanne Lamont, S U Z A N L E M O N T. Yeah, she has a lot of free workshops too. I believe she's in the Netherlands. Okay. Thanks. Florian, anything to add? No, not, not on this point. It's like, I like to, it can be a different shoes or like balls also very inviting, you know, like the, 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 the gym balls. It's just like, uh, and I really like the idea to having the space to arrive, maybe even 30 minutes, 15 minutes. And uh, it's also to repeat it again for us, a great time for observation also. Yeah. And then, and then, try to to bring them to to the floor yeah and and how do we then which method would you maybe recommend floor to to to, to engage with first to to grasp their attention from like an open space into like i have to say for 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 most of the grounding exercises that i do right now and i'm kind of combining all like i'm not working with any groups of small kids but for me, one of the, the deepest ways of getting into grounding is feeling our, our bones, like feeling the density of our bones. And I feel like that's something that everyone can imagine. And, and then I, like, if I'm working with an older population, sometimes I go into the idea of the marrow of the bones and having a sense of fluid, fluidity mm -hmm. with that. So it would just be like, oh, feel the weight of your bones and feel your bones dropping into the floor and feel the connection, like the bones to the earth, you know? I don't know. That's my, that's where I am right now with that grounding idea, like is coming into body and earth relationship. Um, and how about you, Alicia? You're muted. When they get to the floor, I find for grounding, it really starts with asking them like how there's actually a song that we use and it requires them to stretch each part of their body. So each part of their body is doing a different thing and we'll ask them, how does their body feel? So they'll be like, use your right hand. And then we'll talk about it. Like, did, was it hard to use your right hand? Did you find it easy to use your right hand? And that's what works, I would say was about two and a half to seven because they can grasp that concept but older ones they know like how does it feel to do certain movements so we'll do things like run on the spot how did that feel behind your legs how did that feel in your knees um you know we, we won't use time so times never measure or how fast you went or you know how well you did the exercise it's about how did did you feel like it was tight in your shoulders? Did you feel like really loose and silly? And we use words to help them describe it better. Yeah. But I like what you're saying as well. I think it's a similar concept, but younger ones can't always figure out what that means or where yeah. they're going. No, are. I'm totally not talking about anyone under eight. Uh, you know, like, I, like, <laughs> I think the youngest I've ever worked with was five and that was like in a group of five to 10, you know? So like, and I certainly wasn't having them feel their bones. I'm thinking more like older teenagers and young, yeah, tweens and teens. Florian, any ideas, anything, any grounding mm -hmm. exercises? I like, I like to work a lot and I think this could also work with, with, with uh, the a younger population. It's like literally bringing them into the concept that their foot is not one piece. And to really get into the sensing and we can also educate them, they have 25 bones in the feet, you know? And like using really slow movement to, to figure out if there can be space in between these bones. 
and also to start to 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 feed into the sin the sense of interception you know like um and like also like the this like ah my foot no my foot is a complex concert an orchestra basically if you think about it like this you know but it's like like really making them sense like ah maybe there is more to my foot than what i put in a sock and then to experiment like how can i how can i can you sense that there is a movement and and how does it feel to feel uh, inside of myself to go into the sensing? And is there already a first calming with it? Oh, I, yeah. I love using this with, with adults actually also. Yeah. Because it really changes your perception immediately, like from like very being in the headspace for sure, excited, new room, new people like here and here. And just like really go into like start at the bottom. And I also love the concept of the bones. It's very connected to, to what I just said. It's like discover what is inside of your feet. Yeah. And how does it change when you move? And when we, when this is put in a nature uh, setting where you have like small hills or stones to walk around, makes it even more more accessible for people because they can really see how the foot is adapting to like an uneven uneven floor. And uh, yeah, but I think we are very very connected to starting with like a with like with the bones, something that's very very easy to sense. And that's like to like when you when you want to get into the concept of fascia, you know, it's like very advanced. Also, like you need a lot of like overall body awareness and and uh, yeah, maybe the bones are the best point to start. Um, one thing more to say about, and this is kind of the entrance and and even to to change energy. If if like coming into the room, say we have a lot of very active, playful thing like slow motion, also. Like, can you do like, I mean, I know you said didn't, not using time, but slowing things down because we know that like that's the, the landing, right? Coming into awareness and like, oh, well, I have to say this one because I did this with um, when I felt I was working with like sometimes people don't want to move and sometimes people they want to move a lot. So with the, with this exercise, I'm just going to give you a really quick exercise and that is turning your head. You can turn your head a ton and see what's around you and like really take in and that gives you that sense of what's what's in the room what haven't you seen before what of new experience i usually do this with adults but i think it's good with with kids with kids too and when i'm sensing resistance that people don't want to move i ask them to try and move as small as they can and still feel movement so like the tiniest tiniest movement and it could be in any body part but head and neck are really easy because that'll bring the awareness right there and usually like it, yeah. Yep. It, it draws people in and it's also at the same time working on like the primitive brain and calming the nervous system so like first we look around we see that everything's fine then we become interested in something and the world suddenly gets bigger and then we bring it back in and we become interested in, in, in with it within the inside and how can we do this tiny little tiny thing or it could just be your hand like how can you move it so small that you can still feel it moving but it's not and i mean this might not be good for little kids little little kids but once they have some control. Yeah. And, uh, and one thing that, that, that would come to my mind now is to, to go into like, because I really like maybe starting with the feet or with the, with the connection to the floor, then going into the head and then so like, and then send them to an open discovery into like, and what about everything in between? Mm -hmm. And invite them or inspire them to like, check out what kind of movements can you do with this in between? So we would have like an answer, like 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 a, a starting point with like very like very concrete, like foot, head, and then an open space for like what can you do with everything else? Yeah, and I have another one, and this is maybe again yeah. for kids that are over say eight, but like but it could also probably work for kids that were little, just if the word if the if the wording were different. But like one thing also is to come in and just ask what it means to them. When I say grounding, what do you think grounding means? What's the ground? What's, you know, what does it even mean? Just so that we, st again, that's that idea of language and starting to put what we already have into, into the pot of language and, and bringing up the idea of imagery or images. I feel like, you know, for some people, the, the sort of mechanical idea or the the anatomy really works, but for some people it's like all the sort of image-based work. So finding the sort of different entrances for people. Yeah, I think. And again, that's that observation. 
and seeing who says what, you know, who, who's reacting in what way. Go ahead, Alicia, I cut you yeah. off. I mean, I think in regard to the observation idea and the idea of moving your head, one thing that's worked for me in the past is changing the room ever so slightly. And I know we're talking a little bit about setup. Each week I would change just slightly. I would move a poster or I would put something new on the table and kind of see, I would ask the kids, what was something you noticed? Is there something new in the room? And they would take a look and that would start them moving their heads. Like you can't move from your spot, you can't run, but take a look. See if you can move your head and find out what's different. And some of the kids would get it. Sometimes they would shout it out and that was absolutely fine. But everyone got a chance to share about something they noticed. And that usually gives you insight as to what they're excited about. Like some kids were excited about seeing Play-Doh on the table. They would say, ah, oh, Play-Doh. I'm like, okay, I want to incorporate something with Play-Doh today. Or another might say, I really like, I love the dinosaur poster you added. So we might do something in a, like a small movement activity that's really big and allows them to kind of make those, those small and big kind of gross motor movements and the fine motor movements too, um, with their hands and like changing to claws and, you know, getting really big with their leg. Um, so yeah, I really like what, going back to what Laura was saying at the beginning, sometimes you have to be really adaptive and sometimes it doesn't go the way you want it to. <laughs> so you really just have to notice what's in the room because even with the same child, a lot of the times it's different every week. I think that's something important to remember. Children, although they like routine and structure, they don't always necessarily require the same thing each week. Like their hobbies change, their favorite colors change, their favorite food changes. So mm -hmm. I would like to keep that in mind too. I Me mean, as a kid, I would have thought about how can I break this container? How can I avoid the rules? I was pretty rebellious. Yeah, I just remembered something uh, because we were like uh, speaking about like where like like also like maybe giving giving each of the four sessions or the the, the elements which we want to get them into uh, some uh, some theme or connection. And when I studied at the Somatic Academy in the first year, the first module was called floor, like ground. The second one was called space. The third one was then individuation. You know, how am I on the floor in the space? And the fourth one was called communication. Like going into contact with the others by being grounded, being in my space, being myself. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely um, step, stepping, ahead, stepping ahead. So I know we don't need to take these for uh, like, let's say topics or concepts, we could maybe adapt them a little bit. But I think we all agreed already the first one should be really about the ground and yourself and finding the finding instead of like always looking around what's going on, like what's going on in here? Like, and how can I get in touch with it? Like, it could also be like touch itself. Um, and uh, what, what else do we use to get people into engagement movement? I have a touch exercise yeah. and it's, it, and again, it's one that they use with adults and it's a, um, it's a Qigong exercise and it's like, you know, you rub your hands together and then you find the 10 little dragons and then like the 10 little dragons run through the forest and, and different, like according to Donna Eden, who's an energy medicine person, like different ways of moving through, like if you're feeling distract, you know, uh, discombobulated and all over the place, like just combing so that the two sides of the brain like they all have sort of different effects or you know energized or really soft and coming in like can you just feel the hairs on your skin like how you know finding the sort of different levels and layers of touch also um is a really great way of of coming into that tactile kinesthetic sensing from the inside and the outside like feeling myself touching and feeling myself being touched the two the two ways so i feel like that and that can go all over the place like but i feel like that's a really user-friendly one that's fun for everyone maybe teenagers think it's stupid but who knows <laughs> yeah, 
I think like honestly, like when they're like 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 about the teenage, I think it's stupid. If you, if you really can get them grounded, yeah, you know, they, yeah. there might be this openness for it, sure. But like that, that's why I also do this, like working with 14, 14 year olds, like this massive grounding because like to just like also get the thinking away, you know, and like also like to to like they, they, there's always so much com comparing. I don't want to call it competition, but they always look so much like how the others, like move how do the others do that and like uh i think it's like one of the in the development um patterns or or history of the human being with 11 your 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 like definition for roles and society is kicking in um and uh, this is when when uh, in my perception and what i what i experienced girls usually get a lot of self-doubt and boys get very competitive you know like okay i want to get there and like to understand their standing and to, to get this away again a little bit. And uh, maybe one of you can speak about when, when you work with a, with a variety of age groups, uh, how, how it is, because I know that there can be massive steps in between eight and 11, you know? And there's, there's certain, certain young people who can communicate very well with each other, but there's also some who are just like seeing everything that's younger than them as a non, communicative being which is not developed enough to be worth their time or attention uh saying it very extremely now but uh but like yeah how to work with the diversity in the group also mm. well oh I, i'm gonna say something about that because a lot of times the groups that i'm working with have a very diverse age range like not that it just diverse childhood wise i know that there's such like i'll have an eight-year-old and a 16-year-old in the same group and I find that like the way that I usually teach adults or kids or anybody is kind of the same way. Like I'm not shifting my way of being for them. Like, and I feel like it's, I feel like some of the somatic practices and tools, they're so just useful. Maybe the wording is different, right? Maybe like I'm gonna you know, throw more imagery that's relatable in a childish way, but I feel like adults need that too. Like if we're gonna talk about bubbles, like, you know, imagine bubbles sparkling up. Well, imagine champagne bubbles sparkling up, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I find that most of the time having a broad age range like that is actually helpful because the older ones give the younger ones like, you know, an, an extra edge. And there's also this, they, they help each other. Like in, in, the, in the environments that I've been working in, which most of the time it's been like a really good thing. Occasionally there'll be, what I've also found is that there's, there'll be like one person that just destroys everything for everybody. It could be, a, it's usually a younger one, but sometimes it's a medium age one, but there's one a person clone, who's kind like of person. the bad apple. And you just, like the also, yeah. yeah, just one person whose energy is like counter what the whole plan is. And like, there, I mean, sometimes you can, Put focus the energy or give them a job or you know sometimes like you can get work done but ultimately if they're gonna take away the the buy-in which they can by just being like this is you know like if, if one kid thinks something is really stupid and isn't doesn't want to be there it's going to be hard for the other kids to really be seriously into the thing like i mean that's my experience but that's dealing with those different age ranges also it can I don't know, it, 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 it can be dealt with and whatnot, but this is dealing with really working with somatic work with these broad ranges of kids in, in situations of like classical training, you know, it's like, okay. And you got one that it's like, oh no, I don't have to deal with that person that really shouldn't be here. So like the, you know, the self-selection factor, but we're trying to talk about kids in, in situations that, I mean, ultimately it is the choice, right? They have to have the choice that it's interesting and they wanna do that thing. So I don't know. That was a little waffle. I, I, I got sidetracked. Alicia, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I can say from working with seven to 11 year olds and then eight to 13, it's interesting because for me, it's always been the, I've had the same experience where the older ones kind of start mentoring the younger ones and it's really sweet and they develop a relationship and become close, like age doesn't act as a barrier, but then you get that one older kid who had usually had like teenage siblings at home who nothing is cool that's not cool and all the younger ones are like look up to that person because they're the oldest and it's ruined for everyone and then sometimes what happens is you change the 
I usually go back to that child and they're like, what would you rather do instead? And usually they're like, well, if you played this music, it would be cool. So it's not a lot for me to change the music. So I go on consensus as a group. And that's one of the reasons why I always do group norms at the beginning and allow that the kids to contribute to that. Because they know if everyone's been like, yeah, okay, change the music. I change the music. And now all of a sudden it's cool and they're participating and they're still getting the same value out of it. Can you talk a little bit more about doing the group norms and what, what's, what, like, just lay that out for us, what that looks like? Cause I feel like this is a hugely important thing. Yeah. So when I do group norms, I usually start with really basic ones. Like everything is confidential. Like, you know, someone tells you a personal story. We don't go home and tell our parents or our friends. And then I, with even younger ones, I'll put something like, you know, being kind. And then I'll ask them, what is being kind to look like? And we can say things like, what would you like to see in the classroom? What would you like to see in class? So they might say like, I don't want to have to ask to go to the bathroom, like bathroom break. Sometimes you get, or I want to be able to eat in class, or I would, I want to be able I want people to share younger ones. That's usually the first one they go to is we have to share. But even with adults, they'll talk about deeper on that confidentiality level or how they want to participate. So they ask questions like, do you, with younger ones, like even five, six-year-olds, you know, I'm like, would you rather raise your hand to participate or would you rather, you know, give a thumbs up sign? Do you want to just shout it out? Um, and so we make these rules and then we put it on a piece of chart paper and they're put up in the classroom. And even on Zoom, we use like the Zoom whiteboard and that really works too. But another way to really engage is have them, older ones can come up and write it themselves. They might need help with spelling sometimes or figuring out how to write it, but that gives them like consensus. Sometimes we've done in bigger, in smaller groups, we've done like group signatures of everyone signed it. Sometimes we've done a tree where each kid makes a leaf and they put what their one rule is on the tree and then we all read them and the kid gets to put it up and then they sign around the tree. So there's lots of ways to establish it. And when things aren't going, when someone is not really following through with the group norm we kind of just go like oh like take a look at the chart paper and that's for the kid to figure it out themselves without us saying you've done x y and z wrong you're not following the rules we just kind of remind them the chart paper is there and they can go and view it and it's up to them to make a change so yeah works with adults works with kids just changing our language and so if it's you're also, oh just one question so when does this happen obviously it happens at the beginning but does it happen every class in the beginning or is it like yeah. unless the classes are changing so if we've added a new person or a few new people have come on we might do it again or we might add to it but right at the beginning usually one and done um yeah, but it's there. We might say like at the beginning, sometimes with challenging groups that are very active or have a little bit more disruption in them, you might do a little bit of a reminder of these are the group norms. But right. yeah, I like it to be a one and done. Uh, I, I just love this also because uh, speaking about uh, a common ground, Mm -hmm. to start on it is basically also the the, the 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 intellectual setting and the rules we agree on and but also the space we give each other and we allow it's, a, it's also an allowance that should be included in this you know and the, and also telling them like space is about you and your bodies it's not about me i'm just here to be a little supportive you know mm -hmm. yeah i like that a lot I'm making also some notes uh and i was thinking about um like how do we best um, because I couldn't write down everything we said um, to maybe just also use the Google Doc and just like really 
all of us can look in it and please everybody who is uh, who is watching this later or who has been with us before it's also free to to write into it please do not take out of it because it's going to be gone for everyone important yeah uh, don't don't uh, so if you do changes choose your own color or choose your own uh, font or no, something no editing. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no i'm gonna make this mine yeah yeah so i, I would just like uh open up a new section a new page which just like speaks about class one or getting started how about getting started you yeah, know this is great yeah yeah getting yeah. started so are there any things we're in our last eight minutes and i actually have to really run today so are there any things that you think that really need to be that we haven't addressed on opening the space starting beginning what's really important in that first session like, for, like uh, what I've been interested in too is like, how do you handle in your past experience or in your in your general work uh, the caregivers staying being part? Because and I can give you a small example. I mean, like I I, I was working uh, when I was sixteen. I started working organizing children's birthday parties for the local cinema, and uh, I did that for two years, and it was one of my best jobs ever. But it turned out to be one of the best jobs I ever had. The moment I told the parents to just go away for the next three hours, go shopping, have a coffee, read a book, but leave the children with me. And if something happens, I have your phone number, just don't go too far away, you know? And, and in, in this setting, it literally changed the universe when I was the only adult with them, you know? And there was not, and we said that in the observation part also, there was not a caregiver to look to, is it okay what I'm doing? Or like the concentration was really with the, with the, with the youngsters themselves. So do you usually have them in the space too? Or do you tell them, listen, they're in trustful hands. Let's go for the flow. So with, if you're doing it virtual, man, I mean, this weekend, I was like very bust, like internally, frustrated with a parent just having value judgments about everything and I was like I miss that was one of the things I missed about in person my advice is partner with your local coffee shop which is what I did when I was running theater camp there was a coffee shop one block of, like not even a block it's 30 second walk and the parents had a discount on the coffee and the parents became friends they would actually go and talk not all of them there was kind of parents will develop their own clique most often unless you're in a really small community and it's tight knit but yeah that was the best idea I've ever seen in my existence in the world working with kids or having activities for the parents to do if you're in a community center maybe there's a pool or a gym and seeing who you can partner up with to offer something for the parents because if there's nothing for them to do and nowhere for them to go, if they say we've done all our errands, you need another option, you need another way out. So yeah, I recommend partnering with whoever's around you or even another practitioner who can offer something like a yoga class or a meditation class. There's a, a really quickly, I just love the idea of setting a, a space for them up also. Uh, if you do not have a, have uh, when going back to like the very beginning um, when we first started these sessions saying that it's also really important to work with the caregivers yeah. and to let them know what is what is go what, what has been going on you know what did their what did their kid do in the time they were not with them and in a, in a perfect world as you said have a second practitioner who is in another room and who does the same the parents because Lord, there's so many people who could have a who could in any age still learn uh, to learn a lot from from uh, from connecting to their bodies, yeah. and it could lead into a beautiful, beautiful inspiration for also at home repeating something together or seeing. Yeah. yeah. It would be amazing to have the somatic class, like the mommy and me or whatever, daddy and me, somatic class, but not together, right? Just two practitioners, you're in yep. two rooms and even yeah. have like some, maybe some point where they get to interact, like, okay, now everyone's together and they're like, like the intergenerational dan dance or intergenerational somatics. I feel like that's something that's just so missing in our culture. And like, it's, you know, 
that's where we down regulate, where we co-regulate, right? Where we come in and we're like, okay, it's okay. We can, and people have some resource in their bodies, you know, just, I love that. I love that. I, I love all those ideas. Also the community building. I like go to the coffee shop and hang out with those other parents. They're, you know, that's connection. Yeah. That's support. Yeah. I think I had, I'll see if I can find it and I'll post it what the local children's hospital does in their mental health programming because I think it's like on week six or week eight where the parents and the kids get together, but the parents are always in a separate room and mm. they, they have it to a T, really. Um, so I'll find that for our next session. Cool. Very nice, because we're really uh, hitting the end and I'm also like Laura today, like end on end and don't know how I ended up like this again, but I'm like. <laughs> <Thank you. coughs> um, Let's maybe uh, to to sum it up a little bit. I will open uh, like a like a like a getting started class one. Uh, we'll put in some notes. Uh, feel free to add to it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's cool. a, it's a, it's a great start. Yeah. So do we want to um, do we want to like go? Here's our opening. Then what happens in the middle? And then what happens at the end? Do we want to run our sessions like that? Okay, and, and so next time, I mean, maybe we talk just more about what, so we've got like what ideas besides grounding or, you know, landing, like what do we feel like, what are the things that, what are the things we needed, we wish we had, like what are the specific tools and how can we go to those? So maybe we get more specific in that way. And, and maybe there aren't any, maybe it's just feeling grounded, feeling your body, you know, but if we have specific things, because I think there, there were certainly things in my life that helped me and there were things that I wish I had. So thinking in, in, in that sort of term or what you've seen really work, Alicia. Mm. Yeah, yeah. To just awesome. give that one, did you go first, Alicia? Awesome, no, I was just gonna say, I really do have to go. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank you guys so much. I mean, yeah. I will post some resources later in the day and yeah, I'm excited. I might not be here next week, but probably the week okay. after. Well, it was we great having you. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. All Bye. right. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So just one sentence for me is like, was just thinking like in the direction of like, what would I have needed? Is that like when, when just thinking about what we just talked about already be doing in this like first grounding, connecting, getting started class, it's like all my youth, I didn't even have the idea to look at my body from the inside out. I just yeah. re captured moments where I was like more or less just comparing which parts of my body are better than other ones. Right. And why, and like really, really waiting, well, like this and this and this about me is better and really thinking in very judgmental terms. Uh, that's why even daring to say, I perceive myself as better in some ways, you know, it's like, ah, well, I'm, I'm more skinny, I'm taller, I'm this and this, and then just like, going from the body to all the other things that in society are given or not it's i've been in a very toxic competitive thinking yeah, for many years of my of my childhood teenage years yeah. okay. well let me, it was like a very deep yeah deep truth <laughs> yeah. so let's 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 dig yeah. into that in our next session i mean yeah. into those ideas because i see that that exact thing like play out at such a level. And sometimes I hear myself saying a lot of things that I'm like, I really don't really, she really think that sometimes. And I feel like there's a culture of, I have to say bad things about myself or really rip myself apart, like body wise or like, oh, I'm too fat or this is, you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm skinny, like, I'm not, but like people have these, anyway, that's another top topic, but just, it's amazing how much it still comes up. So the yeah. kids and the adults. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, Laura. Thank you. Nice to Speak see later. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.